Well, it's a very good morning <clears throat> to everybody. Um, my name is Liz Pinnock and I'm presenting from our offices uh, in Johannesburg this morning. Um, for those of you who I've not met before, it's obviously Liz. I'm a director and head group legal at RSM South Africa. Internationally, I co-chair the RSM legal group and professionally, my focus is on corporate commercial law, the restructuring of companies, transformation, and corporate governance. I've been asked this morning to present on a topic entitled Corporate Restructuring, the way to a new way forward. The door, sorry, to a new way forward. And before we delve into the topic, I would just like to share a quote from Captain Jack Sparrow. Yes, he of the Pirates of the Caribbean fame, which resonated with me when I was preparing for the presentation. The problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude to the problem. And for me, this is so true in the uncertain times that we are living in. However, I would like to challenge all of us to see the problem as an opportunity that we are all facing collectively and differently. Um, and that there's no blueprint for how a business is to survive and emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. As leaders of our organizations, we need to ensure the agility and the sustainability of our businesses going forward. And against this backdrop, we need to remember that directors of companies will be faced with very difficult decisions at, uh, during this time. They have fiduciary duties to act in the best interests of the company, but also to act with reasonable care, skill, and diligence. The decisions that the, the, the directors make now will be of critical importance as to whether a company will survive, whether the company will be regarded as trading recklessly, or whether the company will be finally wound up or placed under business rescue. So in order to assist you in navigating these issues this morning, I've drawn upon my own experiences to provide some guidance as to the process. Step one is understand the current situation. In the words of Peter Drucker, the world famous management consultant and author whose writings have contributed to the foundations of the modern business corporation, he said, you can't manage what you cannot measure. And this is so true. What's required is an honest and brutal assessment of the current situation in which the business finds itself. This is very emotive and stressful, and businesses will often require objective, independent persons to assist in analyzing and understanding the business, and then navigating those very difficult and hard decisions that have to be made. Without such a process, in my view, without having this foundation, the business will not be able to make an informed decision on its reimagined future. The process requires a critical assessment of the operating environment. Of paramount importance, which we all know, is the conserving of cash, the reducing of expenditure, the forecasting of revenue, profits, and cash flow, whilst also taking into account the effects of COVID-19. Thrown into this mix will be the need to access funding, whether it's in the form of government funding, uh, going to banks to get funding, or shareholder support. And we need to understand what the effects of this funding will have on the profitability of the business over the next couple of years. And what we're finding more and more in practice is an, is an assessment of the workforce. Um, and, and to critically look at, at your employees and, and whether they need to be retrained. Uh, some may have to be redirected and unfortunately some will be made redundant. Uh, also what we see is the renegotiating of payment terms uh, for creditors, for landlords, an analysis of the provisions of contracts, uh, possible renegotiation of some of those contracts, the invoking of those force majeure clauses, a consideration of business interruption and whether a claim can be made, the impact of digital solutions on our business and the IT system and the environment in which we are working. These are just some of our considerations that we've had and that we've been advising our clients on, and they're important for purposes of our deliberations. 
There are also a number of tools online uh, to assist companies to navigate these considerations. Um, we have developed a tool which can be accessed on our COVID-19 uh, resource center, or we can send a tool to, to those that are interested, but there are a number of tools online. Bring up my next slide. Step. Step two is winding up or business rescue. So in order to avoid uh, further financial distress and following the outcome of what we've, we've managed to get under step one, it may be that the best solution for the business is to wind up or to place itself under business rescue. The board of a company will have a duty to account to its shareholders, creditors, employees, registered trade unions on such decision. Now, a voluntary winding up of a solvent company can be initiated by the company by means of a special resolution of shareholders, by the company's directors, or by court order. Should the company elect to file for business rescue, it can do so by filing a director's resolution declaring that the company is or could be in financial difficulty and appointing an independent person known as the business rescue practitioner to take the matter forward. As a consequence, these specialists are appointed. Now, I don't intend to go into further detail on the winding up or business rescue, uh, because that's unfortunately a webinar all on its own. But I thought we'd just mention that. So now this brings me to, to really the crux of it, and that's step three, which is the restructuring of the business. So if the outcome of step one suggests that our business requires a different strategy, one in which the words of Warren Buffett ring true, should you find yourself in a leaking boat, energy devoted to changing vessels is likely to be more productive than energy devoted to patching leaks. And I suggest that a business in looking at this could consider either a distressed merger and acquisition or a restructuring as a way of reimagining itself post COVID-19. In looking at the strategy, it'll help a business transition from a crisis to a long-term survival. So what is a distressed merger and acquisition? Following the economic fallout from the lockdown, many businesses may choose to divest themselves of assets, either to pay down debt, alternatively to fund their ongoing operations, and to avoid going into business rescue or liquidation. And, and we refer to this as a distressed merger and acquisition. And you may say to me, well, Liz, well, what's the difference between a distressed merger and acquisition and a traditional merger and acquisition? My answer is not much other than the timeframes are compacted, and the legal and commercial challenges faced by the buyer and the seller during that process are exacerbated. Now, when looking at that divestment strategy, it would need one, for you to prepare a flexible and fair business valuation, taking into account the effects of business of COVID-19. <laughs> Point two, analyzing the optimal deal structuring from both a legal and a tax perspective. Three, assessing the pros and cons of appointing a deal maker to identify a suitable buyer. In practice, I found a buyer that's in the same market or has similar outlook on life uh, will garner a higher purchase price for the seller. Four, the legal and regulatory uh, issues. Um, and, and this can be quite complex to navigate and includes things like change of control provisions. Uh, what will the, the, the impact be on the, the BEE score of the buyer post-merger? Uh, are there competition law issues? Do we need to, to get the approval of the Reserve Bank? Um, do we need the, the approval of the BEE commissioner? And are there any company law filings that need to be made? And what we find from the position of the buyer is they may elect either to do what we call a targeted due diligence or a very detailed due diligence. And in these days, what we're seeing is increasing use of data rooms and data analytics in order to assist with that, um, uh, with that journey. And coming from the due diligence, we obviously know that the contractual warranties and indemnities then are negotiated in order to mitigate risk on both sides. Now, in my experience, 
it's often better in these situations to, to conclude what we call a non-binding letter of intent. Some of you may know it as a term sheet or a memorandum of understanding, which sets out the salient terms of the transaction, the structure of the deal, and to make certain that the buyer and the seller are on the same page. You know, often they, they pass each other like ships in the night. So it's very important to make certain that they're understanding what they're doing and this will and I've seen this a lot that if they do this it saves a lot of time and frustration and what it does is it garners trust between the parties in addition uh, the parties are also forced to deal with with very contentious issues up front and one of them obviously is the purchase price and the adjusting purchase price as opposed to dealing with those issues later when time and costs are against the parties. On signing of the non-binding letter of intent, the term sheet or the MOU, the necessary commercial agreements are then prepared, including completing the legal tax and financial due diligence. And when necessary, obviously obtaining the necessary regulatory approvals. So now I'd like to, to have a look at restructuring as a means of reimagining the future. Uh, I have written a lot on this. I um, have also um, given a couple of talks on this, and, and I truly believe that this is a, a great way of looking at a reimagined future. A restructuring of a business can create a lifeline for businesses that are experiencing financial pressure. The period of lockdown has allowed many companies to critically assess their operational structure and to determine whether there is a possibility of streamlining their operational efficiencies and reducing costs on that restructuring. So if step one has given us the financial data which we need to make an informed decision, what we then need to do is have a look at the restructuring and whether it can be achieved on, in a tax neutral basis uh, using the corporate restructure provisions of the Income Tax Act and we know that those are sections 41 to 47. If it's not possible to apply the corporate restructure provisions, then I find that the restructuring can become more complex and sometimes it can be more expensive in the short term, not the long term. So when looking at corporate restructurings, in my experience, it can involve either one, a reorganization of the, of the ownership of the company, two, a reallocation of the assets and the business or the function within a group of companies, three, the reorganization of the debt within a group, and four, fin financial restructuring. That is replacing debt with equity and vice versa within a business. Restructuring is complex and those involved in the restructuring process require a deep knowledge and understanding of the various tax, legal and accounting issues. And they require a, a very sophisticated bird's eye view of the transaction. A restructuring assignment involves a collaborative engagement between the legal and tax practitioners. And sometimes what you'll find is that you'll need financial modeling. Uh, you, you, and you need to understand what does that day one balance sheet look like of the merged entity. And sometimes the IFRS treatment of the transaction is important. So unfortunately, whilst we can't escape the current position, the restructuring of a business can be stressful and emotive. And I find as an advisor to businesses, you have to be a good communicator and you've got to be a good listener. And you've got to be emotionally supportive to the business so that the business can itself and its management and leadership can trust in, in the ultimate solution that, that, that's being proposed and its sustainable future. And for me, perhaps the best way to illustrate the restructuring of a business is by way of a case study. Uh, RSM was approached by a multinational company uh, specializing in high pressure hoses and fittings to assist with the restructuring of two of its South African entities. Now, whilst the South African entities were ultimately owned by the same shareholder offshore, 
each company in South Africa was owned by a different intermediate company. So the brief was to merge the two South African entities in a tax efficient way, taking into account the legal and commercial nature of that merger and providing extensive advice as regards the employees of both merged entities. Ultimately, the client was clear. It required one operating entity in South Africa, which was strategically and culturally aligned and which delivered an efficient operating entity and which saved or reduced costs. So the first consideration, which may be obvious or not obvious, but it was, it was, it was really quite startling, is which South African entity to merge into which South African entity and which company would then actually be wound up. And to make that informed decision, we had to do a detailed analysis of the financial records of both companies. And in doing that analysis, it was then to consider, can we apply the corporate restructure rules under the Income Tax Act? And can we achieve this merger on a tax neutral basis and within the time period required? So a position paper was submitted to the board of the multinational company in order to consider the various uh, options and the pros and cons of each. And once the transaction structure had been approved by the board, then we had the legal framework for the merger of the two South African entities. What we then did is we went into finalizing the sale and purchase agreements, including the mechanism for payment, which in this case happened to be an allotment of shares in the merged entity. And the transaction was complex uh, and, and interesting in that it involved a transfer of stock, fixed assets, immovable property, which we know in itself is, is, a, is a completely different process in South Africa, trade receivables, cash, trade payables, and including uh, shareholder loans. And finally, as part of that transaction, the employees then were transferred into that merged entity. A second consideration, and one which was quite practicable, had to look at the software packages in both entities and the basis of accounting and, and payroll. And this necessitated an analysis of the various software used and a detailed integration of these financial records onto one platform using the same software. We were involved, uh, RSM was involved in the mapping and integration of those financial records, as well as preparing the day one balance sheet of the merged entity. A third consideration, and one which was close to our client's heart, involved the integration of the employees into that merged entity. The employees in the one entity had different terms and conditions, uh, different employee benefits, working hours, leave provisions. They are what we would call uh, blue collar workers. Whilst the employees in the other entity were kind of like your white collar workers, where, where they had additional employee benefits, uh, including provident funds and medical aid. So what we did is we prepared a detailed comparison of the terms and conditions of each. We prepared new letters of, of, of appointment for all those employees. Obviously, the policy manuals and procedures were rolled out. Uh, we standardized the terms and conditions of employment across all, all levels of employment. And this necessitated extensive consultations, uh, both of the employees themselves and then the trade union. So a lot of time and energy was focused on post-merger integration and that cultural alignment between the employees of that merged South African entity in order to ensure a coherent and happy workforce into the future. And finally, for my last slide, you know, I often feel these days that we, we like bunnies in the headlamps. Um, but as Terry Pratchett more eloquently says, this isn't life in the fast lane, it's life in the oncoming traffic. So I'd, li I'd like us all just to, to think about, to challenge us to look at the problem today, to engage and view the problem as an opportunity and to restructure and to reimagine our businesses post COVID-19. I'd like to thank, uh, thank everyone for listening this morning. It's been a, it's been a privilege. Um, and if anyone has any questions, uh, you can drop me an email or put some questions on the, on, on the webinar and we'll get back to you during the course of the day. Thank you very much. Goodbye.